Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you this morning on such a beautiful so Sunday morning on the Lord's Day. Uh, it's great to worship together. Uh, if we haven't met, my name's Dan. I'm filling in for Sam today. So it's really, really good to see you. And I apologize if I have to rush off afterwards to Red Rock. school slash children's church is taking place during the service uh, and they're going to be heading out just after the second song uh, which is early in the morning so once you hear that you know that's when your children can head out uh, so all of primary school age are welcome to head out to that uh, but are also very welcome to stay in for the whole service there's also creche facilities available uh, just through uh, through the foyer and to the right down the hall uh, you're very welcome to make use of those at any point during the service uh, it's not on the announcement sheet due to my uh, forgetfulness, but Young Adults is this afternoon at half past three. Uh, we're going to be meeting in the Red Room, and we're going to be uh, looking at the first in our Grounded series. Uh, we're looking at what God's Word is, we're looking at what the Bible is, how it helps us grow in the faith, and can I encourage all who, are, who have left fifth year, who have maybe started sixth form, or maybe in tech, college, or university, maybe starting working life, uh, it'd be really, really good to see you at that. If you have any questions, please come talk to myself. Uh, Wednesday night is choir practice for our harvest services. That's at 7, and that's followed by midweek Bible study and prayer at 8 in the church hall. Uh, they're using the book Love Your Church by Tony Morita. You probably saw some copies on the way in there on the foyer. Uh, if you want a copy of that, uh, do pick one up. And if you want to contribute towards the cost of the books, then you can either stick a fiver in an envelope and fire it in the offering plate on the way out. Alternatively, there's a little box beside the books uh, that you can uh, put your money into. Next Sunday is the church walk at Kilbrony Park. Uh, there'll be a good walk, a good brisk walk, I'm sure, uh, with tea, coffee, and a bite to eat afterwards. Uh, can I encourage you to come along if you're new or maybe if you haven't seen some people in a while? Uh, it'll be a good chance to enjoy fellowship and friendship together. Uh, the only request is that you fire your name down on the sheet uh, in the foyer for catering purposes. And finally, we're still looking for additional volunteers to help serve in our children's and youth ministries in particular. Uh, so if you're willing uh, and wanting to get involved, please speak to Sam or one of the leaders of those organizations. And if you could do so as soon as possible, that would be greatly appreciated. As Sam usually says, we're not here for announcements. We're here to worship the Lord. Listen to the words of the psalmist. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Today we worship a holy God who's set apart from us in sinless perfection and beauty, who the scriptures tell us dwells in unapproachable light. And as we consider his holiness today in Isaiah chapter 6, as we consider that later in the service, let's lift our voices in worship. Let's praise him because he is truly worthy of our praise. He's worthy of the praise of our lips, but also of our whole lives. So let's lift our eyes to him and let's lift our voices to him as we sing together that wonderful hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's stand and sing together.
Well, as we've sung of God's holiness and as we've sung praise to Him, uh, let's pause at this point in our service. Let's come before Him realizing that we are not holy in the light of His holiness. Let's come and speak to Him in prayer. Let's adore Him. Let's give thanks to Him. But let's also confess our need and seek His forgiveness together. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your word reminds us that you sit enthroned over the whole earth, that you are the King of glory. And we acknowledge this morning that you are our King, and to you we must bow. Father, you are also the Holy One, perfect in every way. You are set apart in glory and beauty and majesty from us as your creatures, and we only can bow before you in awe and wonder at your greatness and at your glory. And Father, we acknowledge this morning that in the light of your holiness, we are not holy. You've commanded us in your word to be holy as you are holy. And we realize we've not been. Your word tells us you dwell in unapproachable light and we have no right to draw before you this morning on our own merit. And Father, this week and even this morning, we have been people of unclean lips of unclean eyes and hearts and minds. And Father, as we pause and bring before you the things this week and even today that we know we've wronged you and we pray that as we bring those before you and confess our need, that you would come in healing grace and that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us and you would reconcile us to yourself. And Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ, our Savior and King, bore our sins on the tree, that he's removed them as far as the east is from the west from us and reconciled us to yourself. And we thank you for him and in him we rest this morning. But Father, we also acknowledge that you restore us as well. You restore us uh, to service in your kingdom. You've brought us out of uh, the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your glorious light. And you've called us to be a holy people, a royal priesthood serving before you as your worshippers. And we pray that in the power and by the help of your Holy Spirit dwelling in us, that you would change us day by day so that we would serve you faithfully in all thankfulness, making known the gospel of your Son. And Father, this morning we realize that um, not only are you the holy God, you're the king over all, you're the king of your people as well. You're the shepherd who cares for your people. We bring before you people this morning who we know who've had a very difficult week for those who struggle physically with difficult diagnosis. We pray for those who struggle with broken relationships and all of the impact that that has on their lives. We pray that you would comfort them as you are the God of all comfort, that you would remind them of your gospel, the work of your son. We pray that you would be near and dear to them. We thank you that you care for us. And Father, this morning as we worship you, we pray that our worship would be acceptable to you. We pray that we would draw near and that we would revere Christ as Lord in our hearts. And it's in his name we ask these things. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, we're continuing our journey through Isaiah. And today we're in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, so if you have a Bible in front of you or you brought one with you, can I encourage you to turn up to Isaiah chapter 6. If you're following in the Pew Bibles, it's page 690. Uh, alternatively, it is on the screen. So we're in Isaiah chapter 6, which is on page 690 of the Pew Bibles. We'll be reading the whole chapter. Isaiah chapter 6. This is the word of the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and, they, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tent remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Amen. And we thank the Lord for his word. Now, it's good to see boys and girls in this morning. Uh, and for a couple of minutes, I want us to learn one of the verses that we just read out because it's super, super important, not just for boys and girls, but for all of us who are a little bit older as well. Uh, do you, can you guys help me with that? We thumbs up if you think you can help me with my memory verse. There's a couple of thumbs. Yep, that's great. And uh, mummies and daddies and everyone else can also help us as well. So our memory verse is verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 6, and hopefully it'll appear on the screen. I hope. I'm sure you guys can probably remember it anyway. You just heard it. Uh, it's Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. I'll read it out here. It says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Do you guys think you can try that out? Uh, it should hopefully be on uh, a slightly different PowerPoint, uh, but we'll try it out. It's on the screen. So we're going to go through it like this. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6, Verse 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let's try that through once. Uh, everyone together. Three, two, one. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. That sounded quite good good stuff. Um, boys and girls, this verse tells us that God is holy. Now, can anyone stick their hand up and tell me what do you think the word holy means? Anyone have any idea? Yeah. It means Jesus. It means Jesus. Yes, well, Jesus is holy. We know that, absolutely. But can anyone, can anyone explain a wee bit more of what they think holy means? Yeah. Yes, God is holy. Absolutely. Yes, what a great thing to remember this morning. Um, what, anyone, anyone else want to help them out and think about what holy means? Anyone know? Maybe some adults, maybe, who aren't too shy. Oh, Jeffro, yeah. Special, yes, absolutely. He's different from us. He's uh, not like us, like his creatures, absolutely. Anyone else want to have a pop as well? No, maybe we're a bit shy and a bit tired this morning. I know I'm a bit tired too. But that's right. Holy means that God is special, meaning he's different from us. He's not like us as his creatures. But it also means that God is perfect. And when we mean perfect, we mean that he is morally perfect. He never does anything that's wrong. He always does what is right. You see, when we say something, when we say God is holy... That means he deserves our praise. That's what we've been doing this morning. We've been singing praise to God because he is holy. When you guys see something awesome, what's your reaction? 
Say if you saw a rainbow in the sky, what would you guys say? Yeah, what would you say if there's a rainbow in the sky? You'd say it was holy, right? Interesting, yeah. You'd look to the God who is holy, who made it, absolutely. If you saw a rainbow, what would you say? Would you say, ugh, it's a rainbow. That really looks bad. That's terrible. What would you say? Yeah. It's beautiful, just right. You would say, wow, what a beautiful rainbow. How awesome is that? God is holy. He deserves our praise. So whenever we praise God, we're saying to him, wow, how awesome is he? He is holy. He is worthy of our praise. That's why we give him praise. Now, let's go through this again and see if we can remember it well. So we're going to go in three, two, one. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Sounds good, guys. Keep it up. Now, boys and girls, we've been saying a lot this morning that God is holy. And that's something we praise him for. But whenever we realize that God is holy, and we've thought about this already in our service, if you've been listening closely, we realize that he is holy, but we are not. Remember, we sin, we all say, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rule. That's what we do naturally, all of us, small people and big people. We all say no to God and go our own way. And this means that we can't go near God. It's as if his holiness would swallow us up, eat us whole, because we are not holy. But boys and girls, the story does not end there. We'll even see later when in our sermon, and you'll probably hear in Sunday school of what God has done to bring people like us who are not holy to him who is holy. He's given us his son, Jesus, who's lived perfectly where we've not, who's bore our sin on himself on the cross so that we would be reconciled to God, this holy God. And when we realize this, boys and girls, that's another amazing reason to lift our voices in praise to God and thank him for that. Let's go through this verse once more before we finish. Uh, and maybe later on around the dinner table or whatever you're doing this afternoon, maybe you can try and recite this to your parents or grandparents or whoever's around. That'll be a really good way to spend a few minutes around dinner. So let's go through it again in three, two, one. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter six, verse three, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty the whole earth is full of his glory. Great job, guys. We're going to sing now, and we're going to sing early in the morning, Jesus rose to pray. And while it talks a lot about prayer, and we've been doing that in our service, it also has these, this wonderful line in it that we are to follow Christ, God's precious son. That's our reaction whenever we hear that God is holy, is that we bow the knee to Christ. We trust him, we rest in him, and we follow him. Let's stand together and sing, early in the morning, Jesus rose to pray. And after this, uh, boys and girls who are heading out can head out to Sunday school.
Um, hopefully, PowerPoint will work here. Um, if not, don't worry. Um, you can listen to me. Um, hopefully, I'll not sicken you too much. But I wonder this morning, have you ever seen or witnessed something that has changed you in ways you can never have imagined? In recent weeks, the news covered, as you'll see on the screen, the news covered the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks in America. I'm sure many of us can remember where we were uh, when we saw harrowing images just like that um, of planes being flown into the Twin Towers and other horrific atrocities. And weirdly, I actually have faint memories of being five or six and seeing this on a TV in primary school. You know, our primary school was that advanced, we, have a, we had a television for some reason, but I remember seeing those images. And for many, this, that sight, this very image, meant life would no longer be the same again. When the king of Judah, uh, which is the sovereign king of Israel, that is King Uzziah, when he died, Isaiah had a vision that changed him deeply and prepared him to be a prophet of the Lord to his wayward people. If you've been following along with us, if you've been with us on, here on Sunday mornings or if you've been watching online, you've already seen the state of the people of Israel in Isaiah. Last week in chapter 5, uh, it showed us that these people were wise in their own eyes. They were an unjust people. They loved to satisfy their sinful desires. And ultimately, they neglected the covenant, that is, the relationship they had with the Lord. And it was in this context that the prophet Isaiah had this vision of the Lord. Now, this vision is not disconnected with us. This vision reminded Isaiah and subsequently the people who this God is how they're rightly to respond to him, and how they were doing in their task to be a light to the nations. And in that, we too are confronted with the reality of who God is. And we find that we too must respond rightly to him. And that response is a way that, or this vision is a way that changes us forever. That's what we'll see in Isaiah chapter 6. So I, can I encourage you, if you have the Bible in front of you, can you open it and follow along with us? Uh, be really super helpful. So firstly, we see the glory of the holy God. It's interesting to note in the first couple of verses here that it's, although it says Isaiah sees the Lord, he doesn't actually describe what God looks like. We'll see why that is in a minute. But instead, Isaiah describes what God is like, not what he looks like, which is far more than we ever deserve. And what does he see that shows him that this is the Lord? Well, we have the kingly, majestic language of the throne. He sees the Lord sitting on the throne, how God is high and exalted. Isaiah also describes how the train of God's robe fills the temple. It's God's majesty on full display. In the temple, uh, the place where God dwelled among his people, Isaiah could be under no illusions who this was. This was the Lord and he is the real king. Even though, the, even though Judah was in uh, transition, their king had died, and uh, was in transition to his son Jotham, even though there was political instability, as I was reminded that it is the Lord who is king and the king over all. But in verses 2 and 3, we see something else that God displays about himself. And if you've been listening throughout the service, you'll know what this is. Isaiah sees uh, seraphs or seraphims uh, above the Lord with wings covering their eyes and their feet. It's a bit of a perplexing sight, isn't it? And there's only, this is the only place where these creatures appear in the Old Testament. The seraph were, mean, the, the word seraph actually means burning ones. It's describing what they look like. It looks like they're on fire. The point is this. These are heavenly, holy beings. They're not like humans. They are not humans. But the fact that these seraphs covered their eyes and their feet says something really important that we need to heed this morning. Not even these heavenly beings, not even these majestic beings that Isaiah sees who dwell in the very presence of the Lord, not even they could look at him. The fact they covered their feet symbolized that their movement, their actions, their wills, everything that they did were not governed by themselves. They were govern, governed by the Lord whom they served. They couldn't look at him, and they bowed in his service because we read, God is holy. They call out to each other in this resounding chorus that we have actually joined in this morning in our first hymn. 
they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled of His glory. Not only is God the King of His people, not only is He the King of the whole earth, not only is He the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, the covenant God who's promised grace to His people, but He is also the Holy One. Don't gloss over this this morning. When we say God is the Holy One, we mean that God is both set apart from us. He's not like us. It also means that He's morally pure and perfect. All His ways and His character are good and right and just. He does not do wrong, nor can He do wrong. But it's interesting to note the seraph sings not just that God is holy, but that He is holy, holy, holy. You see, in the language that this was written in, and they have no words for very or really. You know the words we use to emphasize or magnify something? Instead, the Hebrew makes use of repetition. It doesn't really work in our English language, does it? You know, you wouldn't say, you're a good, good, good boy. You'd say, you're a really good boy. Or you wouldn't say, that was a terrible, terrible, terrible sermon, Daniel. You'd say, that was just terrible, Daniel. What the seraphs are saying is that God is holy to the highest and greatest degree that you could ever possibly imagine. And even then, our imaginations, even then, our ability to think that through falls far short of how holy God actually is. And commentators note that this is the only time God is described in this way. God is not described as love, 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 or mercy, mercy, mercy. He is perfectly all those things, of course, we are reminded that God is the Holy One, the Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. And His glory, that is the visible shining out of His holiness, fills the whole earth. It's unmistakable. It's bright. It's amazing. It's total. It's ultimate. It's perfect. And in verse 4, even the temple is shaken by the presence of a holy God. The doorposts and the thresholds shake. The temple is filled with smoke. It was truly an awesome sight that Isaiah was beholding, and he couldn't even look into the face of God. God, the holy, holy, holy one, was present. And I don't know about you, but this is definitely the thing that I forget about God the most. We're most likely to remember that God is love, or God is grace or that he shows mercy to sinners, yes, in abundance, absolutely. But that God is holy, and not just holy, but three times holy, supremely holy, is something that we don't acknowledge. This is who God is. And the question we must ask ourselves this morning, as we read Isaiah 6, who do we believe God is? And this is important, because who you think and believe God is will affect how you live. If we believe God is king and king over the whole universe and king over his people, then we are bound to bow the knee and to trust him and to live obedient lives, trusting his word. But if we believe the opposite, uh, we will live as little kings or queens of our own lives. We'll ignore his kingship and ultimately, both God's word and the test of time has shown that leads to utter ruin. And if we believe God is holy and three times holy, that means we must be worshippers. God will be our delight, our joy, as we're both reverent before Him and also adoring of Him. But this morning, if we don't recognize that God is holy and supremely holy at that, then we'll just treat Him as someone we could ignore. Or we'll fashion Him into a God of our own imagination that affirms our sin and uh, calls it good. Or he becomes someone who doesn't deserve the worship of his creatures. The, the late R.C. Sproul says, we focus all too much on ourselves. That's what sin does. It turns us inward. And too little on the majesty of God. So the question as we start out this morning is, what is your view of God? Do you have a big enough view of God? I remember my father once asked, asked us a question. Is God... God Almighty, or is He God Almighty? How you answer that question will determine how you view God and how you will respond to Him. 
Isaiah's vision shows us that God is not only the king of all, but he's supremely holy. And God's glory and holiness, secondly, is to humble us. That's what we see in verse 5. Isaiah's response to this magnificent scene that he witnesses, you know, is he in joyful wonder at the sight of this just great beauty in front of him? Well, anything but. If you read verse 5, he says, woe to me, or in other versions, woe is me. It's not a word we use often, is it? We don't say, woe is me. But back in chapter 5, if you were following along with us, uh, Isaiah calls out woe to the Israelites. It's a term of judgment. And in chapter 6, Isaiah is saying, in effect, may judgment come on me. What a thing to say. Surely the sight of something so beautiful and majestic calls for your admiration, your adoration. When you see a beautiful view, if you're up the morns, for example, or if you're at the foot of the morns, uh, you don't call judgment on yourself, do you? You say, wow, you don't say, woe is me. But this sight humbled Isaiah because he realized he's caught a glimpse of pure holiness. And in that light, he sees the darkness of his own heart. He realized he is not holy. Pure light always exposes what is in the darkness. And see what he says. He goes on to say, I am ruined. Or as other versions say, I am lost. He's destroyed. He's cast off. He's utterly dismayed. He realizes he's a sinner. That is someone who has not obeyed God as he should. Who's done what God has forbidden and therefore rejected this God. In particular, he acknowledges that his speech has not been pleasing to God. What he has said. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. What he has said, he knows, has been an offense to a holy God. And he obviously doesn't think himself any better than the Israelites who he had just gone and said, woe to you. He says, I live among a people of unclean lips. He identifies with the people. He is, is as unholy as they are unholy. One glimpse in, of the light and radiance of God's perfection, never mind a full view, was enough for Isaiah to realize, I'm snookered here. This is the way Isaiah was to respond. It's how the Israelites were to respond when they heard of God's holiness. This is the shape of the rest of the book as well. Even though Isaiah will go out and pronounce judgment on the people, the way they are to respond to that is humility. It is repentance as they realize who God is and who they are in that light. And for us, our response must be the same. When we hear of God's holiness, when we are confronted with who God is in His Word, it must humble us. It reminds us who God is, and in that light, we get a clearer picture of who we really are. The result can never be arrogance. It can never be pride. It can never be elitism. It can never be, this doesn't matter. We can't plead ignorance before a holy God. Even in 2021, we are people with unclean lips. We speak poorly of others. We know that. We speak poorly of God. We're people of unclean minds, unclean eyes, unclean ears, unclean hands, unclean feet, and ultimately unclean hearts before a holy God. No wonder Isaiah cries out, woe is me or woe to me. The question is, do we realize this morning, does God's holiness that we are confronted with in his word as we have just read. Does that humble you? Does it humble me? Does it bring to mind the ways this week and even today when we've done the exact opposite of what God expects and commands? Does it lead you to seek forgiveness? To repent, that is to turn around 180 degrees, go the other way. If that's you this morning, that you realize this, whether for the first time or considering your own heart and life afresh, then you are in the best place possible. Paradoxically, it's when you come to the end of yourself, when you feel utterly lost and ruined before a holy God, that is the best place to be. Because that is the place of great grace. The holy God humbles us. The holy God, however, is also the forgiving God. We see that in verses 6 to 7. God meets Isaiah at the point of his greatest need. He comes with cleansing, forgiving grace. We read one of the seraphs fly to Isaiah with a live coal, that is a burning coal. This coal is taken from the altar, which is in the temple where this vision happens. And he touches Isaiah's mouth with the coal. 
Now this coal came from the fire that was on the altar, uh, which was continually lit. And you could say if in Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 13, and the, the fire was to be continually lit, i.e., God told them, keep her lit. The fuel included coal, and the sacrifice that was placed on the altar, like a lamb, was not only killed and its blood shed over the altar, but it was also burned. Fire in the Old Testament represents a number of things. It represents God's presence as um, God led the people out of Israel in the Exodus, or out of Egypt in the Exodus. But it also signified God's purity, His just wrath against sin. And so as the sacrifice was burned, it meant that God's wrath was poured out on the lamb, on the sacrifice. It meant that God's wrath was averted from the people, that they would be forgiven and enjoy His grace and His favor. And in the same way, Isaiah's mouth being touched by the burning coal from the altar was a sign or signal of God's forgiveness of his sin. He purified his unclean lips. He took away Isaiah's guilt of his sin. This was a deep cleansing. His sin and his guilt was removed from him. The wrath he deserved was turned aside. And we read, his sin was atoned for. Paid in full. Covered and this morning that shows us two sobering things that we need to consider. Firstly, it is God who takes the initiative and forgives Isaiah. He meets him at the point of his need, and that is he needed to be forgiven of his sin. God is the one who grants grace, who works to forgive sinners, not the other way around as much as we want to think that way. It's God is full of grace, and he is not stingy in his giving. So if you belong to Christ this morning, does that fill you with joy? Does that make your heart sing that God is not stingy with grace, that God comes and meets us at the point of need? That the holy God, perfect and different from us, is the one who brings you to himself, who brings you into his presence where you could not go before. When we realize the state of our own hearts, and when we wonder at why God would ever love and forgive people like us, we have no other response but to worship. We thought about that in the kids' talk, didn't we? We worship him not only because he is holy, but because he also graciously forgives. And secondly, because a sacrifice would only suffice for Isaiah to be forgiven, it means nothing else that we could conjure up or rely on will do the job, because that shows how serious sin is. It requires the giving of one life for another. So don't miss the wood for the trees today, please. Sin is cosmic treason. It's rebellion against the king of the whole earth. So whatever goodness or church going or works or reputation or whatever it is you want to claim, no matter how high you stack those up, they'll fall far short. And if you realize that today, that even far from trying to earn something from God, that you've actually been just going the other way and pretending he doesn't exist, and if you feel just like Isaiah this morning, then verse 7 is healing balm for you. We require the life of another in our place to bear God's judgment. And even in these small details of Isaiah, we see a glimpse of Jesus Christ, our Savior and King. He's the Lamb of God who John the Baptist said would take away the sins of the world. He's the one who lived perfectly for you, where we have not lived perfectly. He's the one who died savingly on the cross in our place. He rose victoriously for you and I. So today, look to Jesus. Look on to him, the lamb given for you, so that you would be forgiven, and not only forgiven, but reconciled to God. Even as you bring and confess the sin and waywardness and things that you're ashamed of to him, God is ready and willing to forgive, to cleanse, to reconcile. The holy God, whose glory humbles us, leads us to cry out to him, for he is the forgiving God. But finally, as we close, the God who gladly forgives is the one who also restores us to his service to proclaim his word. Having forgiven Isaiah, God actually speaks for the first time in the vision. In verse 8 we read, God says, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Who's the us here? Well, it's showing us the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Who will go for us? United in every way. Having been forgiven, having been reconciled to God, Without hesitation, Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Doesn't even think about it. And what's the task? 
go and tell this people. It's significant here that God restored Isaiah uh, so that in the very ways in which he had failed God would be the very instruments with which he would use to proclaim his word. There's a whole sermon in that. We don't have time to go through it, but take comfort in that today. Isaiah was restored for the task of going to the Israelites, to the nation, and to proclaim a message God gave. And what we find in in the last part of the chapter is that Isaiah was to proclaim both judgment, but also the hope and the glory of grace. God tells him to say in verse 9, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Sounds a bit perplexing, doesn't it? Even more perplexing is the command in verse 10. Make the heart of this people callous, that is hard. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. What are we to make of this? It sounds odd, doesn't it? Why would God want them to say something like this? Well, simply put, God is showing that Isaiah's message of judgment would produce hard hearts and dull ears. Is God being unfair in this, in sending Isaiah for such a task? Well, no. If you've been following with us, you'll know what the Israelites have been like. Their hearts are already hard. Their ears are already dull. Even though they've known what the Lord requires of them for centuries, even though he has shown them mercy and love time and time again, they continued to reject him. So as as Isaiah goes with this message, God is telling him of the effect of his preaching. It won't produce understanding. It won't produce true hearing. It won't produce obedience. Isaiah will be dealing with a rebellious people who will continue in their rebellion. They will not see rightly, hear properly, or turn to the Lord and be forgiven. This will be God's judgment on them. This is how far they had fallen hard their hearts were. And to compound this, Isaiah asked the question, for how long, O Lord? How long do I have to say these things? They're going to hate me. You can understand. God responds with a sobering foretelling of what's going to happen. He tells him, there's going to be invasion. There's going to be exile. There's going to be cities lying waste, the land ruined and ravaged, and the people being taken far from the land. Isaiah had the unenviable task of proclaiming this to the people. He wanted to proclaim it to them because he wanted them to turn, but he knows that they won't. God tells him they won't. Yet despite the doom and gloom, despite the impending reality of judgment for the people, we will still see God's mercy towards his people. See, verse 13, the same word that will harden many will soften some. We read, and though a tent remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. God would be faithful to preserve a people in the land despite the destruction that is coming. And he still will be faithful to people who are exiled. We read that in some of the other prophets in their writings. And then he goes on to use this wonderful image which, as we draw the clues, draws our eyes Christward. He says, as the terebinth and oak, that are two types of trees, as they leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. At the house I grew up in, in Drumbo, uh, we had a palm tree in our small front garden, and it was a completely random feature of the house. I didn't understand why we had it, Uh, But it did make it recognizable when you're trying to tell people where your house was. You say, the one with the palm tree. But every so many years, I remember the tree would wither, and my dad would come out and chop it. And all that remained was a stump. But remarkably, I used to watch out my bedroom window, looked out onto the palm tree, and I would see little shoots coming up around the stump. And within a year or two, there was a whole new palm tree, stronger and better than the last. The image of the stump was one of the great hope for the Israelites, for those who truly trusted God's promise to save. Even though they will be cut down in judgment, God will not abandon them, and life will still rise out of death. And what does Isaiah say the stump is? Or who does he say the stump is more accurately? The stump is the holy seed, 
or the offspring, to use another word, in chapter 11, which I'm sure Sam will go on to in the coming weeks, Isaiah understands that this holy seed is a person. He speaks of a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a person who would be anointed by the Spirit of God, who will rule and reign over his people, who will restore peace with God and with each other. He will be a signal to the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Who is the son of Jesse? Who is this one from the line of King David that was promised? Well, the answer is clear. It's often the Sunday school answer, isn't it? It's Jesus Christ. He's the holy seed of Eve, who God promised would crush the serpent's head. He's the offspring of Abraham, who would be the heir of all God's promises to him. He is the son promised to David, who would be a greater king. And as we will later read in Isaiah 55, he is the servant of the Lord, faithful to the very end, where the people have not been. And he suffers in the place of his people. This was the hope of the Israelites those who truly heard and rested by faith in God's promise to save, that this stump of Jesse would come. This is the stump that they could fling themselves on. This was Isaiah's message. This was his task. And why does that matter to us today? Well, firstly, it demonstrates to us that even in 2021, why some people do not come to Christ when we explain the gospel of Jesus. It's why we lament over people. It's why we weep over loved ones who don't know Christ. Even when we've prayed to the Lord and asked them, open their eyes to the beauty and glory of Christ, the reality is that as we share this gospel, it will harden some even further. We too had hard hearts, remember, before our eyes were opened to the gospel. Does that mean that people will always continue rejecting the gospel all their life? Mercifully, no. We know many people who have come to faith much later in life, having been hardened time and time again. So that's being encouraged this morning. And when it seems tough, whether we see little fruit of our labor with family and friends, work colleagues, whether it's here in church and BB and Youth Fellowship and Sunday School, um, wherever it is that we get the opportunity to share this gospel, the outcome belongs to the Lord. The old reformer John Calvin, reflecting on this very passage in Isaiah, reminds us that the truth must always be heard in our lips, even if there's no ears to receive it. Secondly, this serves as a warning. As you have heard the gospel today, as you have heard of Christ, as you've seen him, don't harden your heart. Although Isaiah was to foretell the coming judgment of God in the form of invasion and exile at the hands of the Babylonians, of the Assyrians, which really happened in history, outside of Christ, we face a greater exile. We must stand before God, and outside of Christ, we will always be found wanting and separated from his gracious presence in a place the Bible calls hell. Let's not beat around the bush. Jesus is the stump. He is the foundation that you must fling yourself on. Don't harden your hearts this morning. We are reminded this morning afresh that God is holy. So let us see ourselves rightly. Let us see ourselves as people of unclean hearts before his pure and holy, holy glory. But let's not despair. As we've seen, God is the one who comes in cleansing, forgiving grace to those who realize and confess their need. And through Jesus the stump, he cleanses from all guilt reconciles us to himself, and even better, equips us to proclaim his word, to proclaim his glory in the gospel. What better news to go into this day with? What better news to go into the coming week with that you and I can come near this holy, holy, holy God, dwell with him forever, and make him known as well. Let's pause and pray together. Heavenly Father, as we have heard your word this morning, we pray that you would humble us at your holiness. We pray that you would not let our hearts be arrogant or prideful, but that we would come to you humbly and ask you to forgive us of our sin, knowing you are full of grace and mercy. We thank you for Jesus, the stump who we can fling ourselves on for rest from our sin. And we pray that as we consider your glory this morning, that we would time and time again be brought to the foot of the cross 
We pray uh, that as you have reminded us in your word, that you restore us to proclaim your word, that we would be faithful in doing so. You'd help us when we see little fruit of our labor. You'd help us and trust the outcome to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close our time together by saying that appropriate peace before the throne of God above. Uh, we're going to praise God for the truth that before His holiness, we can actually go and enjoy Him through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Let's lift our voices in response to the one who made an end of all our sin. Let's stand and sing together. Our benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.